Hello and welcome back to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ram Kumar. And I'm your host, Nico. Hey, Nico. And what are we going to talk about today, Nico? So this is the second part of Paula Stefan's interview. And uh, this time we will we'll try to go into more detail about research assessment and also maybe what the situation of uh, doing a postdoc or PhD is like in the States. Okay, but speaking about doing a postdoc or a PhD, what do you want to do after your PhD? Well, I have not. I mean, I want to stay in science. That is that I know at least for now. Uh, but uh, what exactly I want to do is I don't I have no idea about. I think this is a decision I will make maybe in a year or two. Well, that sounds scary as well as something that we all have to face. Yeah. Right? What about you? I don't know yet. It depends on how the PhD goes. Is something which I've been saying to everyone who's asked me this question. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to say it, to the public as well. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. All right. So without any further ado, let's uh, get on with the second part of our discussion with Dr. Paula Stefan. The publication in these big journals is a sort of a metric for people to be judged based on, right? Right. So what do you think is a good metric for research assessment or a researcher's assessment for their uh, life other than because these are somehow causing issues with the duration of a postdoc, with various other things, duration of a PhD even, right? Oh, uh, well... Uh, I mean, I think they cause lots of problems, all right? And some of these big journals have even, in the last four or five months, we've seen that their peer review hasn't been perfect, right? We've seen, I mean, just look at what's happened with Lancet and another, and a number of journals, okay? So, well, I'm a big believer that reading articles and talking with people about their research and thinking about how their research kind of ties into things is the best way to evaluate people. But I think that it's very hard to convince university hiring committees to do more of that. And um, one reason I think it's so important to really know about the research is that we find, in work I've done with Reinhilda, and um, with Jean Shen, who's at Leiden, we've shown that what we see as novel research, and we think novel research is very heavily correlated with risky research, it's much less likely to be published in these top journals. And on the other hand, it's much more likely five to 15 years out to be highly cited. So people pay attention to it, but it takes a long time for people to pay attention to it. So one of the problems with these top journals is that oftentimes it's just looking at the very short run, and, and I think that sends bad career incentives as well. So, I mean, there's not an easy answer here, but I think that all of these platforms we have, like Google Scholar, et cetera, um, really reinforce this. And in some work we're doing right now on the European Research Council, we have access to all of the applications and we've matched it with all of their publications. And we find that for, this is research still in progress with Jean and Reinhilda, we find that the European Research Council, if you have a history of doing this novel risky research, you're less likely to be funded, which oh, is okay, discouraging, is, very discouraging. That is unfortunate, I think. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I think one part of this research assessment or one problem is that it takes a lot more time to go through all of the research Absolutely. that the people have done, right? And so basically, if you have, I don't know, 100 or I don't know, even up to 1,000 people, uh, 
applicants, how or what would you recommend to um, try to get through as many as possible while still reading their research and trying to focus on the person, and not just uh, okay. Well, nature's, obviously, uh, you need some way of screening people, but I would really suggest that when you get down to like ten to fifteen people, that you have interviews like with Zoom or whatever with small groups in which people really have to talk about their research and what they would like to do in that setting. And I think there are a number of departments. I'm trying to think. I think um, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute last fall had a conference where we focused on some of these issues. And I forget the person, but from a major medical school in Texas, they talked about their hiring policies in which they spend much more time talking with candidates about their research than at the end just focusing on bibliometrics. I do think AI encourages a lot of this. I mean, I think a lot of, of applicants are initially being screened with AI applications. Okay. So basically, the technological advances also make it easier to use these metrics. Unfortunately. Okay. And there are new metrics every day, right? I guess, yeah. I mean, if you look at uh, the Twitter or uh, these platforms oh, yeah. as well. And I, I'm amazed how many scientists now have podcasts. I've done a number of podcasts recently, and I think a lot of them feel that it's one more important metric for them to have a oh, podcast. To have a podcast? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think so. To host a podcast. All that right. you know, these are people already hired, but their university values their doing that because alt metrics have become somewhat important now. Okay. Well, for example, a podcast would really fit into the theme of what uh, we do here because both of us are PhD students, and the reason we're doing this is because we wanted to communicate the science or bring the topics or research evaluation, open science and open access to uh, various people. So I, I also feel podcast a nice medium, although it may not, it, I mean, it's definitely not one for just the CV or. No, or I the, think, <laughs> I think it's great because one of my concerns and on most of the, like on the postdoc committee and on, I just got off another committee, which is called the next generation of biomedical researchers um, from the National Academy. And one of the things that really concerns us is that many PhD students and postdocs really don't know the bigger picture. They haven't been shown any data. They don't know career outcomes. They, um, and anything we can do to help people um, know more about what their options are, I think is extremely important. I mean, before you mentioned the ERC, that you're um, on some committees there as well. And do you know how the ERC is trying to improve their research evaluation? Um, because, I mean, if they, they are the ones that can help people start their labs, right, with their starting grants, if you get one of those, it's more easy to oh, actually absolutely. get your PI position. It's a lot of money. So if they decide that you're worthy of their grant, then you can get a position. So how do they evaluate research or how do they try to do it properly? Well, I mean, the ERC, the ERC um, when you go to be a reviewer there, they remind you that they would like to fund risky research. They remind you that, you, you know, that that's kind of their motto in a sense. Um, And they, in, and recently, I believe the limit is you can only list 15 publications. This is new. You used to be able to list much longer list of publications. Uh, um, so, so the ERC has worked at it in that way. Um, but I still think that lots of people who review Their first instinct is to go to Google Scholar and look up people on Google Scholar. It's an easy way to think about people. I think it's very hard to discourage panelists from doing that. 
Um, I really do. I think the ERC, I really, I'm, I'm a big fan of the interviews the ERC does. I think the interviews are, are very good. Um, and I think that if you make it to an interview, um, it's likely that somebody's going to fund you, even if it's not the ERC, that, that you'll get funding from your country or something. So I think that's been a plus. I'm not a fan of the fact that the ERC hands out grants of equal size to each field. I think that's a little crazy. I think that, I mean, I don't think people in my field of economics need 3 million euros to do their research. I really don't. And I think, I mean, I've criticized the ERC for this um, because one thing it does is it encourages people to hire a zillion postdocs because how are you going to spend that money? So the last, I was on the Synergy group and one of the questions I asked each group we brought in was what were they going to do to help their postdocs get jobs? And were they concerned? A lot of those projects had like 20 postdocs on them. It's a lot of postdocs. Well, the Synergy grants are for 9 million euros. They're big bucks over a long period of time. But I think that's the wrong incentives. I think I understand why it happened because it's easy to make people in the social sciences feel like they don't really do research. And people can look down their nose, we say in the U.S., at people who do research in the social sciences. So getting the same amount of money gives us equal importance. But I don't think it's a good outcome, okay? I think if I were the ERC, I wouldn't do that, and I also might not fund as many postdocs as are funded. Uh, another thing that uh, we so I think the both of us watched the uh, the talk you gave at the HHMI Dora uh, event, and oh, it was at the Dora event you watched, not the one I also gave a talk at Janelia mm -hmm. in February. So I was thinking that's the one you okay. watched. Uh huh. Yeah. So uh, w one thing which actually came to my mind because you the, you were discussing the move of the structure at least away from the university model where people get positioned, then apply for grants to start uh, so the various things. So how do you think, so you're aware of the Max Planck uh, structure of Right, absolutely. Well. So how do you think the two compare and uh, what's your opinion on this? Well, I have to say that on, on at least three of these National Academy committees I've been on, we've been very interested in talking about models like the Max Planck model. All right. Um, I, I think that from what I know about it, it's hard to get data. So it's hard to base this on other things than just experience and knowing about. But the idea that the Max Planck Institute is, is doing research without creating a lot of new PhDs, although there are joint programs with the Max Planck Institute, right? Aren't a number of you in joint programs? Yes. With a university? Yes. I mean, the, the, oh. you, only the university can give you the degree in the end. Right. So you have to have a joint right. program. So in some sense, it does contribute to the supply side. Okay. And um, so my, my big concern, uh, well, I have, I, you know, I've been impressed with what Mike Splunk does. I am also interested in thinking about places that are less in the training mode and more in the research mode, um, but where postdocs can go and work, but that they're and but also where we have more of a role for what we call staff scientists. We haven't talked about that, and I think in the U.S. a big problem has been that we have not created enough staff scientist positions. So this is somebody with a PhD who um, works in a lab, has a lot of responsibility, but is not responsible for getting the money to fund the lab and probably does not work 3,000 hours a year, 
probably works about 2,200 hours a year, a lot, but not, not outrageous hours compared to postdocs and graduate students and the principal investigator. And somebody who's probably getting paid maybe eighty-five to $90,000 a year at some point, um, which is reasonable, but not like a faculty salary, which is in a, a top PhD in the biomedical sciences is probably getting 300000 in the U.S. or possibly more than that, okay? Um, and we just don't have many positions like this. And one thing that one would hope is that research institutes would have more people in these kind of positions. So, for example, I visited Janelia. Do you know about Janelia? Yeah, and Janelia has a number of staff scientists. The National Institutes of Health, NIH, has a number of staff scientists. And if you ask universities why they don't have many of these, people say they're too expensive. They don't want to pay for them out of their grants. But I think that's just because of the culture that's evolved, and I think it's because postdocs have been so cheap. So if you have a huge difference between postdoc pay and staff scientist pay, you tend to hire postdocs. I mean, now what is actually then the postdoc salary? Because, I mean, I think I remember also from one of your talks that you were saying that the postdoc salary should be increased. As I mean, I've heard just from some people that if they have family and so on, it's even hard to sustain that if uh, not both people work, especially with childcare and so on in the U.S., so, um, well, I've been yeah. I've been arguing for an increase in postdoc pay for over twenty years now. Wow! Indeed, that's how I first met Richard Freeman at a conference on postdocs, or when we really started talking a lot more about this. Um, so, postdocs in the U.S. have been very poorly paid, and. Um, As just about seven years ago, the average postdoc was probably getting about $38,000 a year. And there were postdocs who had no medical insurance. And, and one thing is that until about the last 10 years, on many campuses, there hasn't been one office that kind of coordinated postdocs. So they had no major advocate on campus. And instead, they were being hired just by, it's like a faculty member was their own little firm. And somebody would write and say, can I come do a postdoc? And the faculty member would hire them. And um, it was unclear what their status was in many ways. And that created lots of problems. And you had universities that were paying postdocs as low as $23,000 a year. And these were mostly postdocs from underdeveloped countries um, who would come to the U.S. and work at that wage partly because they thought they might possibly be able to stay. And Is that before or after tax? Well, you would pay very little tax. On, if you were earning that amount, you would probably pay virtually no tax, okay? Mm -hmm. But... <clears throat> But I know some campuses definitely that paid that level. So, but I would say the median was around 38,000 to 39 when we were working on our report mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. on the postdoc. That, by the way, was for postdocs in all fields, but it was cha chaired by a really exceptional protein structure researcher named Greg Petsko, who's currently at the Harvard Medical School. He's really a terrific person, and he cares a great deal about these things. So I, I have advocated paying postdocs more for two reasons. One is I think it's an issue of equity. Mm -hmm. I mean, postdocs have been terribly exploited, I think, and mm -hmm. underpaid. But also, as an economist, I think it's an issue of efficiency and bad market signals. Mm -hmm. Because there's, until you raise postdoc pay, 
there's no way you're going to nudge universities to hire more staff scientists. Mm -hmm. It's just too good a bargain, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it's too tempting. And so again and again, beginning in 1998, and then with the postdoc report, and then with the trends uh, with the next generation, I've been one who's who's made a strong case for raising postdoc pay. Mm-hmm. And each of these reports encourages it, recommends it, has told the National Institutes of Health um, to raise their postdoc pay. And that's important because a lot of universities look at what NIH is paying postdocs for grants mm-hmm. to, to use as a benchmark. But the thing is, it was very hard to get any university to do it <laughs> because they thought if they were the only one who did it, mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. Um, they'd be paying more and not really getting any benefits, okay? Mm-hmm. They didn't want to go it alone. And so then, ironically, under the Obama administration, we got this requirement that the Fair Labor Standards Act was going to change and that you had to pay 47700 and something dollars or you had to keep track of how many hours everybody worked and then you'd have to pay them overtime. Mm-hmm. Well, we know that most postdocs work many more. They work lots of overtime, but nobody was keeping track of it. And universities really did not want to be in the business of legally having to count hours. Mm -hmm. And when this legislation was passed, very quickly NIH said we're going to pay the 47 whatever, Mm -hmm. which was a big increase. It was an increase of maybe $6,000, which is a pretty big percentage increase. And very quickly most universities followed along. Um, And then the irony is that Trump was elected president and very quickly they decided that postdocs weren't going, it wasn't going to apply to postdocs. Wow. And it wasn't going to apply, well, the the law got changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But the irony is that given that NIH had announced it and given that universities had announced it, it's very hard to take back something you've done. And so... It worked. And so, um, post, I mean, it's just a great irony. But all along, we had said that we didn't think it would work unless it was mandated to pay them more, Mm -hmm. that it was very hard for individual universities to do something by themselves. They were going to follow the pack. And this is a great example of that. So I suppose now if we go online, postdocs in the U.S. are getting around 51000 because there's usually a cost of living in it. I haven't looked in the last year. And, of course, there are institutions like in the San Francisco area where the cost of living is so high that have paid more. And, I mean, you can find that. Um, there are still some institutions that are definitely paying less because this isn't a law in any sense. But that's still just peanuts compared to how much training people have. When we were writing our postdoc report, I went into the U.S. Census data and looked at how much people were earning, people who went and got an undergraduate degree and got no more training seven years after getting an undergraduate degree, what they were earning, Mm -hmm. and they were earning more than postdocs were earning. Wow. Okay, so you have a classmate Mm -hmm. who didn't take any more training and they're making more than you. (laughs) Okay. And and that, I have to say that those kind of data really encourage the members of the committee to sign on to the proposal to raise Mm postdoc salaries. Mm -hmm. They were very surprised. Okay, so they didn't even know about this before. Well, they didn't think about what the benchmark was. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, of course, it's it's self-serving in some sense not to know, you know? 
Yeah. If you wear if you wear blindfolds, you don't have to. Yes. You don't have to worry about it as much. Okay, so <laughs> basically that means if uh, by any chance I would like to go to the states as a postdoc now, I wouldn't have to worry about earning uh, around thirty thousand uh, because although the law changed and got changed back, right now they're still keeping the average postdoc salary. At yeah, I think that's definitely true. Although I cannot tell you what, how I'm, it's very hard to know what will happen about because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I think one thing that COVID has done is that there were lots of postdocs who were in the job market, mm -hmm. and the job market hasn't been hiring. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm I think that we'll have more people staying in their postdoc positions if they can mm -hmm. than usual. That happened in the, you know, in the crisis of 2008, 2009. And I think it's likely we'll see that, but I haven't seen any data yet mm -hmm. to know. So I can't, my suspicion is there may be less hiring, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there has been more money put into certain parts of NIH recently. Okay. So would you oh. maybe uh, uh, recommend people to s go to the U.S. as a postdoc now from Europe? Or would you rather say, you know, it's better if you do a postdoc in Europe as well? Oh, well, I think if you're applying for a postdoc, you should hedge your bets and apply both places, okay? Okay. <laughs> But I think if you if you got a postdoc in the U.S. with somebody you really want to work mm -hmm. with in a good lab, mm -hmm. I think that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just I just can't tell you for sure what the demand is right okay. now. One thing I'd like to touch uh, on again was actually the staff scientist position. So you mentioned they are more uh, more expensive for labs, but in theory, they should also have a lot more experience and then could also help training, I guess, uh, the PhDs and postdocs. Um, so their benefit should be rather clear, I think. Um, so what kind of incentives do you think should be given to funders that they support these staff scientist positions? Well, I think the big issue is that most funders don't think about the support in terms of positions. They think about how much money they have to spend. So the scientist puts together the budget and the proposal. And that's definitely true of NIH. Um, it's true of NSF. So you have to think about, if you're asking for money, how you want to use your what your request is for. So I think that's the bigger issue. Now, there are people... And you'll tend to find more staff scientists in the labs of people who are supported as HHMI investigators. They get a quite handsome amount of money of something like a million dollars a year. And that's to help pay the rent for their lab at their university, and it pays their salary, but it also pays for some small equipment and for postdocs, graduate students, and staff scientists if they wish to use it. And I haven't done a study of this, but I have interviewed a number, and I know a number of HHMI scholars, and they, almost all the ones I know have a staff scientist working with them. And I have to say that when I talk, um, I've talked to a couple of people about this who are running labs, And they think, one thing they really like is that they think staff scientists tend to be more careful also because they don't have, they're not desperate to get an article in Science or Nature, and they may be more cautious. I mean, you know, there's a lot of concern that a lot of research is being retracted, um, that people have been sloppy in labs and have looked for results so they can get things publish, and that staff scientists are more cautious about that because, in a sense, they're thinking about the long-run reputation of the lab, not just what happens to them personally. Okay, so you would say, basically, it would also benefit uh, science as in itself, that the quality uh, that uh, of research produced would 
be increased because uh, people actually want to produce good research and not just publish in in a nature new uh, in science. So. I, I think one can make that argument. I've made that argument. I don't have the data to com okay. to support it, but I have a lot of anecdotes to okay. support it. Okay. So and this, I mean, I guess also goes into a bit of direction of what kind of research is funded. So you were mentioning uh, that risky research is not as likely to be funded by ERC, for example, as well. So, but is risky research the type of research that is better or advancing uh, um, science more than other types of research? Well, I think it's very important for funders to have a portfolio of what they support, okay? We don't want all risky research, and we don't want all just very applied, very predictable research. But it's for sure that things that really add to the, that really shift the knowledge frontier and that really lead to breakthroughs tend to be risky research. So we definitely need some risky research in our portfolio. And I think that there's a big concern among a lot of scientists I know that funders are much, much more risk averse than they historically were maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And that that's a big concern. And there's some people who think this concern really isn't so much the funder themselves but the people who choose who to fund, um, that they, um, I'm working with Chiara Franzoni on a project on risk. And in some sense, I mean, one kind of risk that you worry about, you know, if you have a car, you have car insurance, right? So it's insurance against bad things, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's risk in the sense that you want to avoid something bad happening. So we think panels look at risk in this way, that they want to avoid funding things that you don't get any results. That's the bad, that's the bad news, right? So they are kind of the insurance agents of these foundations, that they're sitting there and getting rid of the risky proposals. Maybe not consciously, but it's the way they it's the way this has evolved. And um, the data certainly suggests that that may be true, okay? That panels like people who continue to do the same thing, that panels like people who haven't done novel research. And I think part of that relates to all the metrics people use and the fact we have so many, many more applicants. I mean, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. fund something like 22,000 people a year, It's very hard to individually think about people in that way. And HHMI funds much riskier research, but they're only funding 300 people. I mean, it's much, much easier to manage risk and to reward risk in that kind of environment. But anyhow, I think that's, I think that's one of the biggest problems. I think coming into COVID, you can think about in many ways, we've been so risk averse in the things we funded that we don't really have some of the basic results out there that could truly help. So maybe as a last question, what would you hope would be implemented in research assessment in the future by ERC or NIH or any of the big funders? Well, first of all, I really embrace the idea that people... Um, not that people have to choose their best articles or the articles that they think are most representative of their work. And so that quality mm -hmm. as opposed to quantity is rewarded and that people are encouraged um, to think about and address how their research in some sense is pushing the knowledge frontier, how it can contribute to that. I also think it's extremely important for panels to, you see, if you choose proposals one by one and you're risk averse in the end you have a portfolio that has no risk in it. And if you're an investor 
Mm-hmm. I hope you don't, when you start investing, I hope you don't choose stocks one by one and don't look at what else is in your portfolio. You need to have a portfolio perspective. Yeah. And I think as mm-hmm. chairs of panels that review proposals, et cetera, it's extremely important mm-hmm. to get the panel chair to think about and communicating this idea that we don't want all of one kind of risk, okay? And that we need, that we are really failing the public because most of these are public funders if we only focus on these Mm -hmm. safe proposals that will have a very mediocre rate of return in terms of what it does for knowledge. Mm -hmm. But we can have some of them because we need some sure bets there but we need to invest in some of these longer shots or and and to really encourage the discussion in that respect what would you for let's say for a person in the phd or a, like a masters looking to do a phd a person doing a phd now and a person doing a postdoc now would you have any words of uh, uh, caution or advice that you would recommend that they follow Well, first of all, I think you really owe it to yourself to look at some of the job market data (laughs) and to try to see what has happened to people who are five or six years older than you and to talk to people. I really think you need to explore what the likely outcomes are Um, and Um, I think lots of people get into PhD programs without doing that. And that doesn't mean if the outcomes don't look that good that you shouldn't do it, but you should really like what you're doing and you should do it with your eyes open and think about um, alternative strategies as you go along. Thanks a lot for uh, the answers. This was really an interesting episode talking about your career and your research and also how, uh, what information you had on research assessment. So it was really great to have you on. Thanks for joining us. Well, it was fun talking to you all and I wish everybody great success with their careers, okay? And if you get a postdoc in the US, be sure and write me. <laughs> man that was an interesting interview so one of our longest uh, so far as well right yes definitely i think uh, this is uh, very important information as well for a lot of people especially early career researchers because we have so many options out there and yet many of us aren't so aware of the available options and how people choose candidates based on what mm-hmm. parameters and all of these I think yeah, it's very important to get to know these information before one steps into this world yes there's I mean there's a couple things right I mean on the one hand side uh, do you actually want to do a postdoc then if you want to do a postdoc do you want to do it in the states and hearing like all of these uh, informations about how the conditions are actually like better now but before they were seem to be quite bad and Mm -hmm. all of that uh, yeah makes you reconsider yes definitely and I also feel a lot of people uh, have with long-term aspirations changed their plans based on the current political environment as well and how these political changes could have an impact on their lives as researchers yes definitely I mean, just, I mean, I, I'm quite happy that the NIH is not going back to those uh, contracts with like, I don't know, $24,000, mm-hmm. which is really hard to just sustain yourself looking at the rents in the, at the big cities. And this is without uh, health insurance. Exactly. So, and then, you know, health uh, insurance is uh, quite expensive there, or rather you'd rather not be injured in the States. Like just seeing bills of people just having to take the ambulance. Yeah. Uh, Uh, is it's insane anyway so I think this was an important aspect that we have covered with the open science awareness initiative and I'm sure we have more things coming along these lines don't you say Nico 
Yes, I think it's, I mean, this is a very important aspect in academia and uh, making these things more transparent, which is basically what open science, I think, uh, wants to do is very important uh, to just make it clear. As Paula also said, said in the end, um, we sh the portfolio of research funding is very important. So making this uh, transparent in who gets chosen and why um, is, I think, a good idea. Yes, that does sound like a good idea indeed. Okay, so with that, we've come to the ep end of this episode of Offspring Podcasts. Uh, this podcast series is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group called Offspring Magazine. The podcast is hosted by Srinath Ramkumar and Nikolai Horman. The intro outer music is by Srinath Ramkumar. The pre intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. Please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next time, it's a bye from Nico. Bye. And a bye from me. Bye-bye.